is an unspoiled network podcast. This is Spoil Me, covering A Wizard's Holiday by Diane Duane. Chapters one and a half, pretty much. In these chapters, Doreen gets in some trouble. And I think that this is what Nita's holiday is about to be. And honestly, good for her. I think she should go. Welcome to Spoil Me. Welcome to the show, everyone. I am Natasha. Thank you very much to Yama for commissioning this episode. What's up? Um, I am hopeful that it doesn't look like there's anybody here in the chat right now, but I'm hoping that the chat is working and that this isn't just an error because I was having some trouble signing in earlier. Fingers crossed. Um, so I just want to preface this um, by saying that, again, the book that I have does not have page numbers. So I'm doing my best at estimating where to stop. I don't know that I chose a good place. If you are listening to this and you are somebody who has commissioned this book and you have a print copy, if you would be so kind as to like, look at some page breakdowns, I would really appreciate it. I'm going to start, I think maybe like requiring that as part of the, uh, the booking process that people tell me specifically which sections to read. Um, because I really, with this series in particular, I don't know why it is so difficult, but it's just, this stands out amongst everything else I've covered as being really impossible to gauge. So I stopped around the line, um, not around, I stopped at the line, uh, Nita, let's get this shopping done which her father says it felt like uh, the whole two first two chapters was maybe going to be too long. I'm not sure if there's like, if that's a good stopping point, we'll see once I start talking about it. Part of me feels like maybe I should have just done the full two chapters, but it seemed like pretty long. So I don't know. It's sort of hard to know. Um, so yeah, I hope that, you know, you guys can understand. And, uh, if it does seem like I under read, forgive me. And I am definitely open to uh, your feedback. If you want to follow a different plan next time than me just sort of winging it. Um, so with all that said, let's talk about this book. So um, I have the new version that Patricia sent me. It doesn't open on my Kindle for my desktop. So I'm going to be looking at my phone. And I just want y'all to know, I'm not texting or playing Candy Crush, I swear. I am just trying to read the book from my phone. Um, and the start of this is sort of like interesting because every time one of these books begins, Diane Duane has some different quotes that she uses before the start of the book. And I, I'm going to read these. Um, so let's see. Unending stairs reach up the mountain above you, and you keep climbing while the welcoming voices cheer you along. They make the long climb easier, though the gift you're bringing may to you seem small. Don't worry, it's what they need. For all the cheering, see how empty the streets are? Take your time, make your way upward steadily towards what waits, through day's blind radiance to the city's pinnacle and fall up the last few steps into empty sky. Hexagram 46, Sheng, onward and upward. No idea what the, what the like ultimate meaning of this is. Um, so I'm curious about that. David Lloyd George quote, with me, a change of trouble is as good as a vacation. That one seems pretty clear. And then William Shakespeare Macbeth, what can the devil speak true? Mm. I mean, the lone one always factors into these stories, but 
I don't know. There's something about that being forecast in this particular way that has me very interested. So chapter one is titled the getaway urge. And Nita is coming home for spring break. And it's described, I really enjoy this, that it's raining. And if anybody was like particularly paying attention, they would see that for some reason, the rain isn't getting this young girl wet. And it's also acknowledged that like people, if they did notice, nothing would probably have even come of it. Humans generally don't recognize wizardry, even when it's being done right under their noses, which uh, that tends to be the, the story with a lot of different um, sort of urban fantasy that I read is this assertion that like, we don't have to hide because people are so willing to come up with so-called rational explanations for things that they do the work of hiding for us. So we don't really even see what's right in front of our faces because we're willing to, you know, rationalize it away. Um, and that just rings very true to me. I know that it can come across as a bit pat within stories and a little bit too easy, but we really do have that instinct as people. And I think that that feels really right. Um, so she comes up the driveway and she is really excited to be on spring break and also very hungry. And she goes to the fridge and I loved this description of what she finds in her kitchen because this was so relatable. I feel like all of us have had this moment of just like everything we pick up has either been eaten or it's like the last gross scraps that you don't even like you're very hungry, but are you that hungry? You know, that kind of feeling. And I just really like, I don't run into this often because I'm somebody who really, I get paranoid about running out of food. I have like some weird thing about it. And so I always have more than I'm probably going to need. But I have run up against this a few times in my life. And this description of it was very funny to me. <coughs> Ooh, excuse me. So half a quart of milk and half a stick of butter, some small unidentifiable pieces of cheese bundled up in plastic wrap, at least a couple of them turning green or blue due to the presence of other life forms, which I really liked that description. It's not, oh, they're going bad. It's there's a presence of other life forms, which does feel like the way a wizard would distinguish that, you know, um, way back in the corner, a plastic bagged head of lettuce that had seen better days, probably several weeks ago, and a last slice of frozen pizza that someone, probably her sister Darene, had left in the fridge on a plate without wrapping it and which was now desiccated enough to curl up at the edges. Man, if that doesn't conjure a fucking picture. And then she goes through the cupboards and she was intending to make like a, a PB and J, I think. And there's just one stale slice of bread between two heel pieces. And the peanut butter jar had been scraped almost clear inside. A few moments of rummaging amongst various nondescript canned goods turned up no soup or ravioli or any of the faster foods she favored, just beans and other canned vegetables, things that would need a lot of work to make them edible. And there, I swear to God, guys, there is nothing worse when you're starving and you just want something for God's sake, anything, and everything you find requires some level of preparation. It's just so disheartening. And I say this as somebody who fucking loves to cook, but you know, there's a difference between liking to cook and being interested in cooking all the time. And, ah, oh man, yeah. I'll, I'll sometimes have my fridge full of food, but everything that's in there requires some sort of prep. And for me, it just, I may as well not have anything, you know, because I just want whatever I can grab really easily. Um, so... She glanced at the refrigerator. Aha, Nita thought. She reached over to the counter and pulled the hands-free phone out of its cradle, went to the wall by the doorway in the dining room, and picked up the receiver of the kitchen phone. The phone at the other end rang, and after a couple of rings, someone picked up. Rodriguez residence. So, 
Long story short, what she's doing here, I love this so much. She is connecting fridges with Kit and exchanging food. Guys, this is wild. When she's calling him, I'm just assuming this is her inviting herself over for dinner, as a human being would do. No, no, no. Um, and I love that this happens so often that Kit knows exactly why she's calling as soon as he picks up. So let's see. She, oh yeah. She asks about the noise in the background when he picks up the phone and he says, I think the TV is trying to, to evolve into an intelligent life form. Evolution can have a lot of dead ends and I'm getting really tempted to end this one with a hammer. The TV says it's meditating, but most things get quieter when they meditate. And yeah, this is when she's like, all right, all right, all right. But I don't want to talk about your TV. I want to talk about your fridge. And he's like, "Uh uh-oh, uh-oh, something inside Nita's house also said, like an echo. She glanced around her, but couldn't figure out what had said it. And you know what's funny, guys? As soon as I heard something said, "Uh uh-oh, I don't know why, I just saw of Doreen's computer. That was like the first thing that popped into my head. I don't know, like, I I, I think it's just because it's sort of a cutesy item. And that's really the only reason that it sort of came to mind that quickly. But yeah, that was the first thing that I thought of. It was just, oh, yeah, her little, uh, her little pet, basically, you know. And I don't think we've heard it talk before. I might be wrong about that. Um, But, you know, again, I don't really know why that came to mind for me because I don't feel like it should have, but it was the first thing. So yeah, she explains how bad things are. And she asks what is in his fridge, milk, eggs, some of Carmela's yogurt drinks, some of that lemon soda, mineral water, half a chocolate cake, Roast chicken. You mean cold cuts? No, I mean half a chicken. Mama made it last night. You know the thing she does with the hot smoked paprika rub and the smoked garlic stuffing? But this time she... Nita's mouth had started to water. You're doing this on purpose. What, me? Let me read your fridge. Hey, I don't know, Neats. That chicken breast could be pretty good in a sandwich with some mayo. Don't know if there's enough for Kit! He snorted with laughter. You really need to get your dad to buy more food when he shops. You keep running out on Friday. If he just... Kit! Okay, look, there's plenty of chicken. Don't bust your naster. Don't what now? I'm sorry. I'm going to need a repeat on that one. I actually did... I meant to look this up and I didn't. Oh, I looked it up and Wikipedia says no results were found for your selection. Uh, translate has nothing dictionary, no definition found. If anybody wants to shed some light, I'm eager to hear. So she tells him to keep everyone out of the fridge for five minutes. And she then begins to talk to the refrigerator. So after it's clear that she says, let me raid your refrigerator over the phone. And I know she, that doesn't mean that she's going to head over there. Then what I thought she was going to do was kind of that thing that Doreen did when she was on that planet and she opened up a little like portal so that she could grab stuff to make a, you know, what, what, what she was making like a bologna sandwich with mustard, something like that. And I thought that was what Nita was going to do, but like in his refrigerator. But instead, she is uh, enlisting the help of the refrigerator. She's trying to do some synergy here. <laughs> you know what I've got in mind, she said in the speech, and you keep having to do it, the refrigerator said. Being inanimate, it wasn't actually talking, of course, but it still managed to produce sound and a sensation that came across as grumpy. It's not your fault you're not as full as you should be come the end of the week, Nita said. I'll talk to my dad. Do you mind, though? It's my job to feed you, the refrigerator said, sounding less grumpy but still a little unhappy. But in a more usual way, talk to him, will you? First thing. And in the meantime, think how broadening it is for you to swap insides with a colleague every now and then. Guess you've got a point, the refrigerator said, sounding more interested. Yeah, go ahead. 
Nita whistled for her wizard's manual. Her book bag wriggled and jumped around on the counter as if something alive were struggling to get out. Nita glanced over and just had time to realize only one of the two flat fasteners was undone when the manual nonetheless wiggled out from under the flap and shot across the kitchen into her hand. I don't feel like we've gotten that many descriptions of this nature of like, you know, her attempting something like this and then realizing that there's something in the way. But I find it really funny. I don't know. I found that sort of charming. Um, so she like flips through and finds the, uh, the spell. And I love this. There, the spell went as spells usually did. The workaday sounds of the wind and occasional passing traffic outside, soft hum of the fridge motor and other kitchen noises inside, all gradually muting down and down. As that concentrating silence, the universe, listening to what Nita was saying in the speech, came into ever greater force and began to assert its authority over merely physical things. The, the wizardry itself was a straightforward temporospatial translocation or exchange of one volume of local space for another, though even a spell like that wasn't necessarily simple when you considered that each of the volumes in question was corkscrewing its way through space-time in a slightly different direction because of their differing, differing locations on the Earth's surface. An iridescent fog of light surrounded her while the words wove and wrapped themselves through physical reality, coaxing it for just a little while into a slightly different shape. She said the last words, the spell activated with a crash of silent thunder enacting the change. And let's see, here it is. This, uh, the, the spell extracted its price, a small but significant portion of the energy presently available to Nita. She stood there breathing hard, sweat standing out on her brow as she reached out and opened the refrigerator door. The shelves looked different from the ones that were usually there. On one of them was that lemon soda Kit had mentioned, a few plastic bottles of it. Nita reached in and pulled one of those out first, opened it, and had a long swig smiling slightly. It was her favorite brand, which Kit's mom had taken to buying for her. I have some things to say. We'll get there. Then Nita looked over Kit's refrigerator's other contents and weighed the possibilities. She had a brief flirtation with the idea of one of those yogurt drinks, but this was not a yogurt moment, and those were Carmela's special thing. However, there was that chicken, sitting wrapped in plastic on a plate. So, Nita begins to make her sandwich. And as she's doing this, that uh-oh happens in the house again. She calls out, trying to figure out who's saying it, doesn't get a reply, and she gets interrupted by the sound of Carmela. Um, what's wrong with the fridge? All the food's gone. No, wait, though, there's a really ugly alien in here disguised as a leaky lettuce. Hey, I guess I shouldn't be rude to it. It's a visitor. Welcome to our planet, Mr. Alien. This was followed by some muffled remark that Nita couldn't make out, possibly something Kit was saying. A moment later, Kit's sister Carmela's voice came out of Nita's refrigerator again. Hola, Nita. Your phone bill's getting too high or something? Interesting way to deal with it. No, Mela, I'm just dying of hunger. I'll trade you a roast chicken from the store later on. Won't be as good as my mama's, but you're welcome to some of this one. We can't have you starving. Come on over later. We can shop. So, she closes the door and puts the chicken back and says a word and the spell unravels and everything goes back to how it had been. So this is a really interesting thing. Uh, welcome to our planet. Mr. Alien Carmela had said Nita absolutely approved of the sentiment. What was unusual was that Carmela had used the speech to express it. A word? Things were getting increasingly strange over at Kit's house lately. And it wasn't just the electronics. His family, even his dog, seemed to be experiencing the effects of his wizardry more and more plainly all the time, and no one was sure why. Though Carmela's always been good with languages, Nita thought, I guess I should have expected her to pick up the speech eventually when she started to be exposed to it. After all, lots of people who aren't wizards use it, on other planets anyway. 
and at least the lettuce didn't answer her back. So this is like, I'm extremely interested in, in what's going on here. And we got sort of like hints of this in the last book, but this is the first time I think that I realized this was going to be sort of an ongoing developing thing. I guess I sort of thought that whatever was going on last time was going to be like wind up being sort of related to Daryl, but that storyline is over and it's still happening. We don't actually get an answer by the end of that book as to what's going on with Ponch. And I didn't really like pay attention to that either. And um, there's just a lot about the, the developing situation at Kits that I was like, I, I just really was was surprised once I stopped and thought about it that I I guess I was just so distracted by comparing and contrasting the old and new versions of the book with the finale of the last book that I didn't stop and ask most of the questions that I normally would at the finale of something, you know, because there, there's just such a larger question about ableism and the depictions of people who are from a group that has been notoriously misrepresented and oppressed. And I was very concerned about that, which I mean, that's valid, but there's a lot of other stuff going on in the previous book and all of those, you know, the larger real life issues sort of took away from me focusing on the plot of the book itself. And yeah, I'm surprised at myself. I just didn't really stop to ask myself any further about what's going on with Ponch or what's going on with Kit's family. Because like th the fact that his sister is just using the speech, I'm not thinking that she's out here studying it. So it feels like she's just picking it up by osmosis, which you know, to a degree, that's how languages work, but not really, you know, I just have to assume that's like part of the influence of just sheer magic. Um, I don't know. I don't know. I'm just, I'm really curious about what this is going to turn out to be. If it's going to be something specifically about Kit, if it's going to be something about Paunch and not Kit really almost at all, or if Kit's influence on Paunch is going to wind up being part of the reason for like Paunch turning into something else. There's a lot that this could be, in other words. And I am, I, I am really curious whether or not we're even going to get a full answer to those questions by the end of this book. Because the questions started being asked, it, it like towards the beginning really of the previous book and we didn't get anywhere closer to finding out what was happening. So for all I know, this could be like something that develops slowly over, over the course of several books. And I'm, I'm just interested in seeing how that shakes out. So this is when she hears the uh Oh again, and she realizes that it's spot the computer. Um, Nita glanced around the dining room for a moment. She can't see it. By the way, her father is the one who winds up later on, like figuring out where Spot's hiding and going and getting him. Um, let's see. Ba -ba -ba. Spot was an unusually personal kind of personal computer. He would speak to her and her father occasionally, but never at any length. Probably this had to do with the fact that he was in some kind of symbiotic relationship with Doreen. Part wizard's manual, part pet, part no telling, really. Um, and Spar Spot's participation in the creation of a whole species of sentient computers would have been enough to account for the weird way he sometimes behaved, but he'd been, con uh, uh, but he'd been constant companion to Darene on all her errantry after that. And for all Nita knew, Spot had since been involved in stranger things. So she's still waiting for him to respond to her. He does not do so. And she sits down at the table again. Um, and she's still thinking about how she's got two full weeks of break and how excited she is about this. There were a hundred things to think about projects. She was working on with Kit things she was doing for her own enjoyment that she would finally have some time to really get into. This is one of those things that, uh, I remember this feeling being in school and having like two full weeks, which felt like such a long time. And now as an adult, 
two full weeks is not enough. <laughs> you know, that shit flies by, especially because as an adult, oftentimes there are so many like, like necessary to life type projects, not hobby projects, but like you need to do boring shit, like drain the boiler and replace the pipes under the sink or just shit like that, that you've been putting off until you had time which inevitably take far longer than you were anticipating. So in your mind, you just have a couple projects to like complete during your time and the rest of the time you get to enjoy yourself. But that's rarely how it actually works out. Usually those things take up about 50 to 60% of your time and you get way less time to chill than you were hoping for. And it just, you know, I, uh, I just was reading this and I was like, oh man, I miss being a kid. And what kills me is that Doreen is in a position that's a little bit too adult. So when I said earlier that I had something to say about this regarding the fact that there's no food in her fridge, I'm a little bit irritated with her dad here. I sympathize with the fact that he is having to parent for two, as he puts it later on when she's overhearing what he's talking about with Tom. And... I, I know what it's like for somebody else to so consistently take care of a personal, uh, a particular aspect of the household that when it comes time for you to have to do it, you have no idea what you're doing. I can see how that would work in theory. That said, though, getting enough groceries for your kids when you've been consistently running out, because the way everybody's talking, like... Kit's mom is buying the soda that Nita likes on purpose for her. That's how frequent this has been happening. If let's say Kit's family goes grocery shopping once or even twice a week, the way that Nita says she had been buying it for Nita, that makes it sound like this has been happening for almost a month the man is getting something as basic as the food supply wrong for a month. What are you doing, man? You know, and what kills me about this is that when she talks to her dad about this later, he admits that this is something that his wife used to take care of and that he's not good at. And Nita says something like, um, cause he's like, do you think you know how much to get? And she says, I don't think I know, but I think that I've seen mom do it often enough that I can make a guess. And he says, okay, that's your job now. Excuse me? Why? Like the fact that Nita even says, I've seen mom do it often enough to make a guess why can't her dad make a guess? Why is Nita the only one that's seen their mother do this consistently enough to even start making a guess? He has been paying that little attention. And then when she's like, I guess I could, he says, that's your job now. Man, that's not fair. You know, and look, I'm not trying to say that Nita isn't responsible and old enough to take care of some shit. But what, what bothers me about this is that he already knows like what she and Doreen already deal with on a daily basis as wizards and that they're frequently in life threatening situations in which like the fabric of the fucking universe is at stake. And he just can't figure out the groceries and won't even try the way that he hands that over to her. So immediately it just feels to me like he's not putting the effort in. And I don't know. This just, I am, I am very sensitive lately to how much more is expected of women running a household. You let a woman be in the position of this guy where he, like, if it was their mother who was failing to have enough food in the house for them when they got home, the reaction of people reading 
compared to how they would react to a dude is so different. A guy, it's like, oh man, they don't know what they're doing. Am I right? What a joke. Like they're just, it, it's taken for granted in our society and pop culture that men are fucking incompetent, even though we let them run the world. And then a woman with this exact same scenario would be seen as an utter failure, a bad mother she must not love her kids. How selfish. It would be like the, the number of, of insults that would be thrown at a woman doing the same thing. It's just doesn't even bear to be thought of. But when it's him, it's not only sort of like shrugged off, but also turned into now Nita's job, which is the thing that always fucking happens societally when a woman has been managing the majority of the household and she dies, then that responsibility is handed to the next oldest woman in the household. It's not the man and it never is. And I'm just so tired of it. And it kind of bothers me that this is happening in this book and it's not really being treated as the, the infraction that I think it is. The closest that we get to acknowledgement of it not being okay is Darene like saying something to Nita about how she's the one always holding everything together for her and her father. And that's like as much as we get. And that doesn't feel right either because that's Doreen telling the, the youngest of the family, telling the oldest child, you're doing too much. Whereas the father who is supposed to be in charge seems like completely unaware or unconcerned at the fact that his oldest daughter is being forced to manage the home. Why isn't he more worried about this? I don't like it. And I, I I'm unsure whether to like, I can't tell by the way the text is written. If I am supposed to be as annoyed by this as I am, I feel like I'm not supposed to be. I feel like it's just supposed to be like an indicator that her dad's having a bit of a hard time managing as a single parent, but the, it, it feels so much more insidious than that to me because of the nature of what it is that he's sort of like screwing up on here. This is the most basic thing. Feeding, clothing, and sheltering your children. Those are the most basic tenets of parenthood. And he is failing at one of them to the degree that another family has stepped in to fill that gap for him for almost four weeks. If we're going on that. And I, I think it sounds honestly like it's been longer, but that's what I'm going to say is like a month. Oh. It just bums me out. And I hope that this actually turns out to be more of a main feature of the plot and not just something that I'm going to be like simmering about over in the corner while the rest of the plot is about something else entirely. Cause I don't want to spend a bunch of time talking about something that is not going to turn out to be like strictly relevant to everything else that's happening. But I also don't want to not talk about it when for me, it feels like a symptom of a larger problem. And you know, we saw in the last book with the fact that Nita was the one like waking up and making her dad the coffee and her father had sort of checked out. I mean, I, I really like, I, I sympathize losing a spouse when you've got children. That's a whole other thing. It's one thing if it were like for me, exam for example, if Owen were to pass away, I would be absolutely devastated, but I would be free to wallow in my self pity and my grief because it would be only about me. I don't have children to worry about. I don't have anybody to pretend to be strong for that. I'm waking up trying to like hold it together while they're around. That doesn't exist for me. So the fact that he has kids and it doesn't feel like he was making much of an effort in that respect bothers me. And I just, I, you know, I want to have more sympathy on this, but it's difficult when I, I don't actually know exactly how much time is meant to have passed since her mother died. I, it probably is mentioned here. 
I'm trying to think like exactly what season it was during a wizard alone, because I don't remember if it's like in reference to these books, I guess the one before a wizard alone was that, um, a wizard abroad. Was that the summer in Ireland? These books tend to take place like kind of close up on one another. Right. So school started after her mother died or yeah, sorry. A wizard abroad was before a wizard, uh, a wizard's dilemma. And she was in school during dilemma. So Christmas passed right during that, like, I think, and I'm, tr I'm trying to place in time anyway, it doesn't matter. Um, what I'm saying is just, I'm going to need him to get it together a little bit more because his children are taking on more responsibility in the general world than he is as an adult. He knows that he knows that and yet is not even holding up his like bare minimum bargain end of things, you know, I just, I don't have a lot of patience and tolerance for men lately, guys. I don't know if you could tell, but a bitch is fucking bored of them. I really am. Um, so anyway, getting back to the book, I'm picking up my phone again. I keep going for the Kindle app on my desktop and then realizing shit, I can't do that. Um, so we find out here that, uh, Nita's been experiencing some shit going on with dreams. Um, the saying went that those who forgot history were doomed to repeat it. And since Nita hated repeating herself, she'd started looking for ways to make better use of the information from her dreams rather than just be suddenly reminded of them when the events actually happened. Her local advisory wizard had given her some hints on how to use lucid dreaming and had finally suggested that Nita keep a log of her dreams to refer to later. Nita had started doing this and had discovered that the dreams were getting easier to remember. Now she glanced down at the page and had a look at this morning's notes. Reading them brought the images and impressions up fresh in her mind again. Last night's dream had started with the sound of laughter with kind of an edge to it. At first, Nita had thought that the source of the laughter was her old adversary, the Lone Power. But the voice had been different. There was an edge of malice to this laughter, all right. But it was far less menacing than the Lone One had ever sounded in Nita's dealings with it and far more ambivalent. And the voice was a woman's. Then a man's voice, very clear. I've been waiting for you for a long time, he says. His voice is friendly. The, the, I think it's pronounced Tombre of the voice. It's spelled Timber, uh, but I think it's Tombre. But there's, uh, the Tombre of the voice is young, but there's something behind it that sounds really old somehow. Nita closed her eyes, tried to remember something more about that moment than the voice. Light. There was a sense of radiance all around and a big, vague murmuring at the edge of things, as if some kind of crowd scene was going on just out of Nita's range of vision. And then there was barking, absolutely deafening barking. Nita had to smile at that because she knew that barking, ex that barking extremely well. It was Kit's dog, Ponch, barking excitedly about something which wasn't at all strange. What was strange was the absolute hugeness of the sound in the darkness. The darkness, Nita thought, and shivered once as the image, which hadn't been cleared this morning, suddenly presented itself. Record, she said to the manual, and sat back with her eyes closed. This is so cool to me. I wish that I could do this with my dreams. Y'all know, if you've listened to other shows of mine, my dreams, it ain't good, chief. Um, space with stars in it. Well, you'd expect space to be dark. But slowly, slowly, some of the stars seemed to go faint, as if something filmy was getting between her and them, like a cloud, a creeping fog. And... As she's thinking about it, she, like, in the daytime, now awake, she's like, all right, you know what? That was kind of a fucked up dream. That's creeping me out. But she's remembering that when she was actually in the dream, 
she wasn't so much freaked out or or creeped by it as she was just angry. Um, Nita looked down at the manual where the last line of the speech recording her last impression was blinking quietly on and off, waiting for her to add anything further. I like that description because it reminds you of a, like a computer cursor, you know? Um, and she can't think of anything else past this point. So she has to end it here. It was frustrating to get these bits and pieces and not understand what they meant. But eventually, when she got enough of them together, they would start to make some kind of sense. I just hope that it happens in time to be of some use. Because for sure, something's going to start happening shortly. The darkness hadn't felt very far away in time. Hmm. Well, if uh, all goes according to how it seems to be headed, she's going to be going to space soon. I don't know if that's going to be relevant at all to this vision, like in terms of her travel or if that will be part of the mission that she winds up on. Um, so this is when her father comes home. And also guys, I said something about how in the last book she's waking up and making coffee the way that her mother used to, but here she makes coffee as he's like heading inside because he comes home and is like, is there any coffee left? And she has to be like, no, it's really gross when you just leave it all day. So I made you a fresh pot and I'm just like, dude, you can't just make your own coffee. You know, like, I'm sorry. I just, he's, it's bothering me, man. It's irritating me. She shouldn't be in this position and I don't like it. It's just, it's not fair and it's not, it's not right of him to ask this of her. Um, so, yeah, and when he's, like, uh, looking at the lettuce that she just, like, kind of pulled out of the fridge and left in the sink, he's like, why did it go bad so fast? And she has to tell him that you put it in the crisper. And I'm like, man, how are you, like, a father and you don't know to put shit in the crisper drawer? Like, ugh, I just get irritated. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Um, so they have a conversation about the fridge and how it's irritated with the way things have been going. And he's sort of, uh, like laughs at the idea of her talking to an inanimate object and she reminds him that he's really into gardening and he talks with his plants all the time which is really the same thing and he says something about how uh that it's the frequency of the sound waves and she says that's like saying telling someone you love them is good just because of the sound waves if you were from Mars and you didn't know how Im- the Im- uh, how important knowing people loved you was, you might think it was the sound waves too. Don't you feel how the plants like it when you talk to them? They do grow better, her dad said after a moment. Liking? I don't know. Give me a while to get used to the idea. All right, fair. So yeah, this is when she uh, mentions Spot. And... Let's see. Um, Oh, yeah. Here's the part where he's like, fine, then that's your job now. Let me get on my work clothes and we'll go out as soon as Doreen gets back. "Uh Uh-oh, said that small voice again. "Uh Uh-oh. Uh-oh. What is it with him? He sounds like he's having a guilt attack. So he goes and finds him, pulls this little guy out. Uh, it had been undergoing some changes recently, what Darien referred to as an upgrade. In this case, upgrading seemed to involve getting thinner and darker. He had gone black-skinned, except for what looked much like the luminous white fruit logo of a major computer company on its lid, the significance differing being that the fruit had no bite out of it. But Spot also had some equipment less normal for laptops in general. Sentience, for one thing, and at least sometimes, legs. These, all ten of them, silvery and with two ball and socket joints each now popped out and wiggled and rode and made helpless circles in the air while nita's dad held spot up blowing a little dislodged cupboard dust off the top of him so her dad tries to be like what's going on man what's what has Darreen done you know we're on her side Spot's little legs revolved faster and faster in their ball and socket joints as if he were trying to rev up to take off speed Spot, her dad said, come on, it's all right. Don't get all, 
With a pop and a little implosion of air that made the dining room window curtain swing inward, Spot vanished. And neither of them has ever seen him do that before. So they're both sort of nonplussed. <laughs> and he's wondering where Doreen is. And then there's a knock at the door. And it's Tom. And Tom is here to dole out some punishment because Doreen has been doing some shit she shan't be doing. And <laughs> I love how like uh, Anita's dad for a second is like, oh God, what has she done? He's got, you know, the worst idea in mind. And Tom has to be like, it's not as bad as the th last things that happen. But yeah, she needs to take some correction. And I like it being framed that way. Instead of punishment, take some correction. Um, so Nita uh, is talking to Kit for a second on the phone. They arrange for him to come by, but she's like, I really have to hear this. So I'm going to have to let you go because Doreen comes home and she hangs out outside the dining room, listening to absolutely everything that happens. And later on, when uh, Tom kind of calls her out on having hung out there and listened to it all, she's embarrassed. And I'm like, girl, do you really think that they didn't know? Come on. You have to be smarter than that. You have to know that they were perfectly aware. Um, Nina made her way into the dining room and sat down very quietly at the edge of the dining room table where she could just see into the kitchen. Oh, they're in the kitchen. My bad. I was thinking they were in the dining room. She was in the kitchen. I'll give you three guesses, Tom said, why I'm here. And Spot knows too, I'll bet, which is why he's so skittish. Doreen, you know that as a responsible wizard, you have an obligation to tell the people who are still helping you manage your life about what's going on with you and when you're intending to embark on some course of action that is going to affect them. Uh, yeah, well, I was about to... In some cases, that information should really reach your family before you embark on the course of action, wouldn't you say? Assuming that you want to stay in a good relationship with the powers that be, which right now seems increasingly unlikely. <sighs> Coming from Tom, that's harsh. Dere Nita saw Doreen go so pale, her freckles looked about four shades darker than usual. Tom put out his hand. And as if from the empty air, the most compact version of his wizard's manual fell into it. Let me read you my copy of a message that doubtless will have reached you via Spot not too long ago, and which is doubtless why poor Spot is having a crisis of the nerves. We confirm availability for two of your species in the sponsored non-interventional excursus program at this time. However, your applicant supervisee wizard's proposal for an excursus is rejected for the following reasons. Durational impropriety, evasion of local issues, attempt to circumvent local dirigent authority. You know what? I just meant to look up what dirigent means. Let's give me a, a, a dictionary. No Definition found. Come on. Let's see. What is Wikipedia said? Dirigent may refer to conducting or dirigent protein, a class of proteins which dictate the stereochemistry of a compound. I'm going to guess that's not it. But I assume that what this is meant to be is just like, you know, whoever is meant to be in charge of her. Um, Tom paused, looking down at the page with an expression of annoyed bemusement. Actually, he said, despite the fact that the powers that be have listed about 12 other reasons, those are really the, uh, those three are probably sufficient for the moment. Um, and he tells her father, cause of course, you know, her dad is listening to all this and has no idea what any of it's about. And he's like, so can you help me out here with making it a little bit clearer what's happening here? And Tom says, Doreen has signed herself and Nita up for a cultural outreach program. And I love this because Nita's listening and she's just expecting this to be something Doreen did. But when she realizes that like Doreen tried to involve her in whatever it is, she's like, what? Uh, and her dad's like, it doesn't sound that bad. And he says, probably not until you consider it would have involved them spending 10 to 14 days halfway across the galaxy or sometimes somewhere further off. Um, and th 
Tom says the similarities with the student exchange program also mean that while Darene and Nita were gone, you would have had other wizards staying here with you. Darene's father slowly turned his head and trained a look on Darene that was so blank, it was scary. I was going to tell you, Daddy, Darene said in a much smaller voice than previously. It was just that you were going to tell me, huh? Not ask me. I just thought if I got everything arranged, got it all set up, then I could talk to you and we could... What? You were thinking you'd just present this thing to me as a fait accompli? Bad move. Daddy, we've all been... Some time off would have been really... Uh Uh-huh, Nita's dad said, absolutely without inflection. Out of his view, Nita covered her face with her hands. Did Nita know anything about this? No, it was going to be a surprise. The message confirms that, Tom said. It wasn't Nita who was being sanctioned, Harry. Well, it didn't sound like Nita's style, but for your part, consider yourself lucky I don't ground you. And Tom is like, yeah, about that. You can choose to not ground her. I don't get a say in that, really. I have been instructed to restrict you to this system for the next two weeks as a corrective. And I love this. Tom snapped his manual closed and tossed it into the air. It vanished. Next time, Tom said, think it through. I love that. There's something very big dick energy about just like tossing it into the air and it just vanishes. Like, I don't know. I love that. Darene. This is their dad. I think you should go take some private time to consider what you've been up to. Forget leaving the solar system. For the time being, I don't want you to leave the house. By any means, so no doing transport spells in your room. In fact, I don't want to lay eyes on you till Nita and I get back from doing grocery shopping, so go on now. I really am sorry, Doreen said very, very low. Nita gives her about a 6 out of 10 for sincerity, but when Doreen passes her, she can see on her face that Doreen really means it, and she bumps it up to 6.5. Doreen was angry, but also genuinely sorry. So Nita gets summoned into the room. It's revealed that everybody knew she was standing there. She really didn't give you any idea she was up to this? This is all news to me, Nita said. She doesn't tell me everything she does, and I can't always guess. Which may be a good thing, since if I'd known about this, I'd have reamed her out, Nita was about to say. Then she stopped, because she didn't know if it was strictly true. And she asks about this program, and she says, I thought somebody had to nominate you. Oh, not always. You can sign up for yourself. Which plainly Darren did. Harry, Tom said, I think we all, um, I think all we have here is a case of Doreen doing what she usually does, pushing the envelope, testing. It's not that unusual for an early latency wizard. You come into your power in a big way, then it drops off in a big way. And afterward, you're likely to spend a while plunging around trying to redefine yourself as more than a wonder child. There's always the fear, was that all I had? Was the way I was when I started out as good as I'm ever going to get? Takes a while to put that to bed. I like this constant, like, revisiting of this phenomenon with young wizards. You know, I, it's a wild thing to have it be that they they have access to more power when they're younger. That trope is just not something you see anywhere else. So it seems right that that is something that you have to cope with, you know, and it's just such a, a, a an interesting thing because, you know, I think that in a lot of fiction, we have that trope of older power, older wizards being more powerful simultaneously as like, you know, a, a very practical expression of with more experience comes more ability. But also there's a part of me that feels like we want that to be true because youth has so many advantages over age in so many physical respects that we want there to be an advantage to being older in a fantasy. And, you know, like what if there's not though? (laughs) Um, So I don't know. I just find this interesting. And Tom says, um, 
The adult wizards are worse than kids in some ways. As you get older, there's an unfortunate tendency to start losing the innate hunger for rules you have when you're young. And her dad sort of pushes back on this in a way that I found surprising because to me, that's just like a given. Of course, kids crave structure and rules. And even her father later on is talking to Tom himself. He says something about how he's just trying to create a sense of stability for the two of them. And I'm like, so you know that kids crave rules. Like you're saying that yourself, but evidently that specific wording catches him off guard. Um, so then Nita, I'm running out of time here, so I better speed this up. But um, she, Nita goes upstairs to her sister and is just like, what were you doing? Like, come on, man, you had to know how this was going to go. And Doreen says, I needed to get away just for a while. I needed, I don't know, not a vacation. I needed to do something else somewhere else. Millman said a change would be a good idea if I could swing it. And for you, too. And this is their school psychologist, which for some reason I never expected to hear from again, even though he literally works at their school. So, of course, he's still going to be around. Um. I'll bet he t- didn't tell you to do anything like this, Nita said, annoyed. You know how it has to look to dad. He's going to think you don't think he's being a good enough dad or something. But it's not like we were going to be away all the time. It's easy to come home at nights if you want to. There's a protocol all set up. The powers give you an expanded world gating allowance and everything. You don't have to worry about blowing huge amounts of energy on transport or deal with something. Uh, if you have to deal with something else back home, you can be back anytime you want. And the rest of the time you can concentrate on being where you are. Nita let out a long breath. That, she said, kind of looks like the last thing you were doing, Dare. Doreen rubbed her eyes with her hands. It was their dad's gesture, helpless and pained, and Nita's inside seized up when she saw it. That's something that, because I don't have siblings, I don't really experience, is seeing them do a thing, but I definitely have moments where I will do something that my parents used to do, or I'll say something with the inflection that my mother used to use, or still uses, you know? And I'll be like, oh, my God, wow. Like, it's just wild how we absorb shit and we don't know it and don't notice it, you know. Um, and this is when Darian says, you've been toughing it out all this time. Um, you think I don't see when dad and I can't connect? You're the one who winds up talking sense to him and to me and getting us all going in the same direction. But who's there to make things easier for you? You're getting worn out with it. You need a change of pace, something besides worrying about whether we're okay. We're tougher than you think you than you think we are, but you Doreen fell silent, possibly unwilling to say what she was thinking. And D- Nita herself is like, Oh God. I kind of have had this thought myself that I would love to be able to just be away, managing my own shit by myself. And I let's see. I wish just for a few days I was somewhere I didn't have to deal with helping put everything back together in some new shape that doesn't have mom in it. That line got to me, you guys. I swear to God, a new shape that doesn't have mom in it. Ouch. Oh, God, you know. You meant, uh, Nita says, you meant well. You just have to take these things past meaning sometimes, especially when it's dad. Um, Have you thought about just trying to be good for a while? You could throw him seriously off balance if you kept at it long enough. Yeah, Doreen said after a moment or so, that might be worth seeing. Do what you can, Nita said. Give him some relief. What about you, Doreen said. What about me, what? And Doreen says, you could still go and you could bring Kit with you. And Nita just comes up with all these reasons why not. Uh, This thing with dad needs patching up. There's no way he'd go for doing it right now. And Doreen is just kind of watching her. And I think as this is happening, she is realizing that, like, as Nita is coming up with reasons why it can't happen, she's realizing that she actually wants it more than she thought she did, you know? Um, So... At this point, she goes downstairs, finally. They kind of, like, 
wrap things up with uh, Darien complaining about her bed sustaining some damage after being put on Pluto, which I had forgotten about. I love that. And she overhears Tom and her dad talking about him parenting by himself. Um, and Kit comes over at this point. And uh, let's see. Choo-choo-choo. Oh, yeah, here it is. Um, Nita had been spending a lot of time with the manual over the past months, starting to explore for herself the kind of research wizardry Tom did. In particular, she'd been studying the speech more closely, mostly for its own sake. There was always something new to find out about the language in which the universe had been written, but also with an eye to finding out other ways to deal with the lone power than just brute force. I've been doing some more research on the inactive and pre-inactive modes, ancillary oaths and bindings. Um, and Tom's like, oh yeah, that's kind of like related to our oath. So definitely keep looking at that. Uh, her dad's goes to change before they go to the grocery store. And then she's talking to Kit about Carmela, who is, as he puts it, hosting auditions for a boyfriend. There's a new one on the phone every 10 minutes. And I really don't want to be around when she narrows them down to the short list. Um, and I really enjoy that. Carmela seems great. I would really like to get to know her better. Um, and Kit says that business on Mars, we need to get it taken care of before it gets out of hand. Um, and she tells him about what Doreen did and he's like, Ooh, damn. Yeah. That I can understand them being kind of upset about that. It's a shame that you couldn't go. Oh, come on. I couldn't go now. Why not? It's spring break. We've got two whole weeks off. And she says something about how it wouldn't be right somehow. And this kind of killed me because I gave up on a massive opportunity that I was offered because my parents had just split up and I felt like my father needed me. And I went home rather than take the opportunity and stay in California doing a job that had been offered. And when I got home, my dad had moved out of our house and into a one bedroom apartment where there was no room for me. And I wound up having to move in with my aunt and uncle anyway. And I think back sometimes about how I did something thinking that I was needed and I wasn't and sacrificed like an opportunity for myself without even like checking with my father. If he did really need me, I just sort of assumed because I felt weird and guilty and it just, this really like felt like the same thing to me. Um, so yeah. And then there's this moment, uh, she says, I, you know, I don't know if your parents would want you to come. And Kit says, my dad wouldn't mind. You haven't been over in the past couple of days between Carmela and Ponch. It'll be easier to see than for me to explain. But when I told my pop, we were going to have to go to Mars. He said, don't let me keep you. I bet your mom didn't say that though. No, mama suggested I go take a look at Neptune while I was at it and not hurry home. Nita snickered. Seriously, Kit said, this would be really neat. If we went to see Tom and then they get cut off by her dad coming in and saying they have to go grocery shopping. And that was where I stopped. So, um, yeah, I am over time. So I have to wrap. Yama just got here. Oh, I'm sorry. Yama, you missed the whole thing. Um, but yeah, Yama, I don't know if you have a paper copy of this book, but if you can tell me what to read for the next section, I totally guess this time. So, you know, it wound up working out to about an hour. So that was, that seems fine, but you know. I just, I don't know what I'm doing sometimes. Um, All right, guys, I'm going to wrap. Thank you again so much for listening. I hope you're enjoying. And until next time, toodaloo, motherfuckers. Spoiled Network Podcast.